Chapter 14. Drifting. In the weeks after the sailor's dishonor, life on board the Prosperity settled into a serious, quiet rhythm. The late-night card game stopped, and there was less laughing and joking among the crew, even below decks. I could feel some unspoken tension among them, like a low, steady thrum. We were crossing the tranquil green sea, Aside from the occasional dolphin or whale breaching the surface, the water was almost as calm as a lake. The wind barely filled our sails, and the air got stickier the farther south we went. The top of my nose burned and peeled, and my skin turned sala fruit brown. I would never fit in with the pale assistance back in Mangkon now, but I almost didn't care. I was slowly becoming sea-hardy, and I liked it. The prosperity may have been moving slowly, but Master Payoon worked as feverishly as ever. He had long ago used up all his medicine for his hand tremor, and he needed me to help him draw daily charts and write notes for the captain. After Pattaya Island, we would head to Fallin. From there, our southern course was still undecided. The final decision would be Sangra's, but she was dependent on Payoon to advise her. Every day we read through old ship's logs and studied other maps, which Payoon criticized ruthlessly, trying to piece together our own chart to give to Captain Sangra. For an expedition like this, it's very important to have a good, solid plan, Payoon kept saying. Otherwise, you can spend months flitting around from one empty patch of ocean to the next, or even get lost altogether. But how do you chart a course for somewhere no one has ever been, sir? Ah, that's the thing, said Payoon, tapping the side of his nose. Do you really think that in the entire history of time, no one has ever sailed where we are trying to go? I glanced at the box where he kept his tiny silk maps. The Pramong, the fishermen. You told me they sailed beyond the borders of the world. Do you think they crossed the 50th parallel? Possibly, or others like them have. But of course it doesn't count unless you hoist a Mancon flag over your head when you do it, he said with a snort. He gestured to the bookshelves where he kept all the documents and materials he'd brought from home. Our task is to follow the wake of those who sailed before us. We just have to figure out where they went. Not an easy feat by any means. I smiled at him. This is fun, isn't it, Master Payoon? It's work, Sai. Hard work. That's all. His mustache quirked from side to side, and I knew he was trying to hide his own smile. Map making with Master Payoon was fun, no matter what he pretended. In fact, I think I could have been genuinely happy with my life on the Prosperity if it hadn't been for two things. The first was Grebe. Our work kept us apart mostly, but in the rare times when we were on deck together or crossing paths on the stairs, I had the feeling that he was watching me. He never spoke to me, and I never caught him looking directly at me, but I could feel his stare like a tiny spider crawling across the back of my collar. Did he suspect that I was the same girl he had followed in the fens? But if he did, then why hadn't he told anyone by now? I didn't like the idea that my fate was resting on whether this kid could put it all together, but until I could figure out a solution, there was nothing to do except stay out of his way. The second thing that weighed on me was my future. No matter how hard I tried to put it out of my mind, I couldn't stop thinking about my inevitable return to Anlong. I racked my brain, but I couldn't come up with a new plan to avoid eventually going back to the Fens. For years, I had clung to the goal of leaving all that behind. With that goal out of reach, I was adrift. I wished I could speak to Rian again. She had been so funny and kind when we chatted that day, and I longed for someone light-hearted to talk to. I daydreamed about us becoming friends, even though I told myself that was ridiculous. A decorated war hero? Friends with a kid from the Fens? It sounded like a joke. But was it so impossible? We had something in common, didn't we? Her family hadn't given her a lineal either. I doubted she had a background as low as mine, but whatever her station was in life, she had risen above it. I longed to know how. I still clung to the hope that somehow I could do it, too. I looked for her any time I was on deck, but she was always in her room or with the captain. I didn't run into her again until we had arrived at our first stop in our voyage.